Hi, this is Saka Brahman from the Orthoclips podcast series, and today I'm with Dr. Harold Van Bossi from the Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. He is an associate professor of clinical orthopedic surgery at Temple Medical School and Jefferson Medical School, and today we're going to be talking about arthrogryposis, principles of management. Thanks, Dr. Van Bossi, for coming on the show. Saka, it is a pleasure to be here. Great. So let's get into it. Um, I'd like to ask, how did you get interested in the field? Um, were there any cases that kind of struck you as a resident or was it in fellowship or was it in practice? And what drew you to focus your practice um, in this field? So my story is one of those wonderful convoluted ones where you think you know what you're going to do when you get into practice. Uh, I'm one of these guys who really thought I had my whole life course plotted out uh, and ended up in orthopedics by accident. And then I was... I knew what I wanted to do in pediatric orthopedics, and I spent my first three years at one uh, hospital, and when I got lured away to another one, which is a, a bigger hospital, a bigger pediatric orthopedic section, they wanted all of us to choose a specialty within pediatric orthopedics. So I just done three years, I knew the world, and I said, I'm going to do cerebral palsy. Well, we got somebody doing that. Now, nah. osteogenesis and perfecta. Nope, somebody's doing that. Uh, spina bifida. Uh, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, whatever I chose, somebody was already doing. And it looked like there was going to be nothing open for me to do. So about six months later, my boss actually came to me and said, hey, what about arthrogryposis? I'm like, well, yeah, okay. I, I've seen a kid or two of that. I can do that. Uh, and so what I like to say is I spent a whole weekend reading up everything there was on uh, the orthopedic management of arthrogryposis. And then you know, we had a, a monthly clinic. What was lucky was it jives with a few other things I like to do. I really enjoy working with external fixators. And I realized early on that kids with arthrogryposis with these really bad knee flexion contractures, you could straighten them out with external fixators. Uh, Gerard Bailey had written about that. There are a few other articles on there. So that really fit in with what I like to do. This was also uh, right at the end of the 1990s and um, Ignacio Ponsetti was just really starting to hit his stride. People really started to pay attention. He had just published his book, uh, and I was very excited about doing club feet. Well, most kids with arthrogryposis have club feet. And even though Ponsetti didn't really think there was an applicable uh, method for their feet, we started doing it and started having successes, and it just kind of took off in that way. But I also was just going to be the side thing, the thing I was going to do once a month in, in uh, my specialty clinic. Uh, but over time, it started to pick up some steam. And I think what happened is that the word of mouth got out, that people started saying, well, here's a guy who doesn't turn around and right away say, oh, your child will never walk. There's nothing we can do for him. Then he instead was saying, hey, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. Uh, my favorite motto uh, over the years has come to be that um, – I am rarely disappointed by what these kids can do, but more surprised by what they can do, that they show off to me what they're able to do. And that's kind of been the start of it. And when I came to the Shrine now almost 12 years ago, uh, the, Shrine, the Shriners Hospital in Philadelphia was just a great place to be. And it just opened up the whole country uh, to referrals. And that's where it took off from being an interest to being about 80% uh, or so of my practice. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, plan for these things sometimes and then they, they just kind of uh, develop uh, organically or otherwise. So very interesting. So maybe you can explain the basics about arthrogryposis, uh, I would say at an orthopedic resident level, uh, maybe like a graduating orthopedic resident, like what, what are the main principles about the disease that they should know? Well, it's really interesting because it's not a single condition. So I always like to say, it's like, you know, having a cold, you know, that when you have a cold, you've got a runny nose and you've got a sore throat and maybe a cough and sneeze and that kind of stuff, but you don't know what causes it. Don't know if it's a bacteria or if it's a virus or, you know, who knows what allergies. But the same thing with arthrogryposis, it turns out that there's now about 400 different things that cause a child to be born with what we call arthrogryposis. And really what that means is there's a child who has contractures of two or more body parts. So if you got a kid who's born with bilateral club feet or let's say bilateral dislocated hips, that's not arthrogryposis. But if they have one club foot and one dislocated hip, that then by definition means that they have arthrogryposis. Uh, most 
of uh, the conditions are genetic, um, and when you break it down, break down the 400 different things we're talking about, but if you actually look at the most common uh, cause of it, the, the, the thing that we think of classic arthrogryposis, it's actually uh, a non-genetic. We haven't been able to find a genetic uh, underlying issue. But what all these conditions have in common is that the kiddos weren't moving much during pregnancy. So they get through the embryologic period probably pretty well. The first two months of pregnancy go well. And then after that, things don't happen. Uh, so if you take an individual joint, you and I have normal joints because we were moving them during pregnancy. Um, and my favorite way to, to explain it to parents is, you know, have them look at the back of their hands and see all those little wrinkles you got going across your knuckles. Well, that's because as a fetus, you were flexing and extending your fingers. By doing that, you're stretching the skin and that's why it wrinkles when you extend. But by the same token, you're also making the tendons slide through their sheaths and you're getting the ligaments at their appropriate tension and you're getting the joint surfaces to conform to each other. So if you don't move those joints, then all those things don't happen uh, down to the level of the skin. That so you can actually have these fingers that have absolutely no wrinkles across their knuckles. Um, and so that's how you get different forms of arthrogryposis. Now, where the issue happens is it, uh, why isn't the, the joint moving? That, that can be anywhere. That can be a, a primary brain issue. It can be a problem of the upper motor neuron going from the brain down to the spinal cord or the peripheral uh, motor neuron going from the spinal cord down to the muscle or the junction across the muscle, the muscle itself, uh, or certain conditions, the soft tissue. So the pterygium con uh, conditions such as uh, Escobar syndrome where these kids have winging across their joints. Um, it, the word pterygium actually has the same kind of root as pterodactyl, so they look like, like big wings. Uh, that is a primary soft tissue issue, uh, and that's what's restricting those joints from moving. Now, the funny thing about Escobar, it actually is a problem with the acetylcholine receptor. Uh, so it's very similar to myasthenia gravis that you see in adults, but it happens intrauterinely. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating spectrum of conditions that lead to these kids, but it also explains the very diverse appearance of these different kids. All right. Um, I think that's, I, hopefully it will also maybe clarify some misconceptions about arthrogryposis by, you know, you explaining it that way. Um, what, are, what are some of the important principles that you found help to successfully manage these patients, whatever those treatment principles might be? Uh, yeah, that's interesting because the, uh, the principles, every time I think I've come up with some principles and there's a set of events that changes all that. So it used to be that you had to jump on these kids right away. As soon as they're born, start working on them. Uh, but then my practice, um, or, or actually I should say the community, the arthrogryposis community, in some ways changed where a lot of people were adopting kids from overseas that had arthrogryposis and they would get to us when they're in their older childhood or even sometimes their teenage years and you'd still have a fair amount of success treating them. Um, but I think the first thing to do is just to, to take a good look at the kiddo and realize that first of all, these kids, by and large, most of the conditions uh, preserve uh, cognitive ability. And a lot of these kids are actually very bright and they learn ways to adapt. And it's not because, well, they learned one way to do it and you should just leave them doing what they're doing. It means that if you then say, hey, I can try to change something, make it, make that joint more functional, make, put that uh, limb in a better uh, functional space, they're gonna learn how to, to work with that also. So like I said, I've had teenagers that have come here that were non-ambulatory, but you start working on them and getting their joints in a better position and you can get them up walking. So for me, what it usually works out as is I'll start off with their foot deformities first. Uh, do serial casting of the feet because they, they generally stretch out pretty well with that. Uh, it could take a much longer amount of time than it does for a regular idiopathic club foot, but you just need to have patience. And at the end of it, you go to the operating room. Uh, we do a um, tenotomy of the Achilles tendon, a percutaneous tenotomy. So just kind of stab a, a scalpel deep to the Achilles tendon, turn it posteriorly and transect the Achilles tendon. And that allows you to bring the foot usually up to a plantar grade position. Um, and so that's 
pretty much as early as we get to meet the kiddo. Uh, if they have hip contractures or dislocated hip, uh, I look to get to that someplace between one and two years of age. Uh, but I've actually found that with the hip contractures, there's no real window that closes on you. You can do that at any age that they first appear. In terms of dislocated hips, I've reduced them up to about five years of age. Um, but I think that older than that, you get into some trouble. And then you have a lot of kids with knee contractures, either the bent knees or the straight knees. Uh, and I've been working my way towards uh, treating all of those at four years of age. Because um, I think then the kids are old enough that the anatomy is big enough to work with. And also they're old enough that they can comply better with their physical therapy. In terms of the dislocated hips, uh, it was um, one of those uh, unfortunate lessons learned. I used to put all of them back in joint, uh, but where I said that most of these kids are cognitively intact, you do find that there are um, a number of conditions where the brains are affected and they uh, uh, will be cognitively challenged. And those kids don't do well when you put their hips back in place. First of all, they don't benefit from it because they're probably not gonna be walkers. Uh, and second of all, they seem to get stiffer than the typical kiddo. So those are the ones I've backed off uh, putting the hips back in place. So you identified a few, I guess, uh, difficulties or challenges. And one of the things I was going to ask is, overall, if you were, if someone were to ask you, what are the biggest challenges you face with these patients? Uh, what what would those be? So for me, the um, the problems that I'm starting to understand better, and a year ago I would have said the problems that I just don't understand, are the kiddos whose hips don't flex up and the kiddos whose knees don't bend. The ones that don't bend, we have procedures for addressing those. We could do Jade quadriceps plasty, uh, or we can do different kinds of um, uh, tendon lengthenings. But what is the right age to do that? And I'm, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure on that. I kept on waiting until the kids were older, because if they had knee extension contractures, they generally got to walk pretty well. But then they get to about eight to 10 years of age, and then sitting in a car is tough, or sitting in, in an airplane is tough. And then you want to bend those legs, but by that time, the femoral condyles have gotten very flat, and it makes it harder to bend those knees. So I've been struggling with that and going more and more early with that. And I have a number of uh, international colleagues have kind of been um, showing me the way on that. Uh, in terms of the hips that don't flex up very well, it's luckily not a lot of kids that we see with that, but it certainly is a huge problem when you have a kiddo whose hips only flex maybe 20 or 30 degrees. Uh, they tend to sit by just making a huge kyphosis in their lumbar spine. And as they get to be adults, they have a lot of pain with that. Uh, one of the lucky things is I'm uh, very active in the arthrogryposis support group. So I have a chance to get to meet a lot of adults with arthrogryposis and kind of figure out what issues they have. Uh, and that kind of informs what I try to do for the, the kids that I'm treating to try to either optimize them as well as I've seen the adults or try to avoid some of the problems that you see with the adults. But those where the hips don't bend up very well is an issue. So what we start to do is get uh, 3D uh, CT scans on these hips. Uh, and the thing that you find is that very often they have an anterior subluxation of the femoral head within the acetabulum. Uh, and sometimes the acetabulum is actually kind of canted anteriorly. And so it's become now an issue of trying to do an open reduction of those hips, uh, do a chondroplasty, shave them down so they'll move better, uh, and then try to bring the femoral head kind of uh, underneath the acetabulum better with uh, both the proximal femoral osteotomy and an acetabular uh, pelvic osteotomy. Um, and I'm still very early on. I've been doing that for about six months now, uh, so don't have a whole lot to report on, but at least it's giving me a direction. So I guess given that, um, is there any particularly important research going on or um, related developments that might show some promise for that in the future or things, you know, to sort of address these difficult uh, cases that you have still? I mean, they're all difficult cases, but I mean, the ones that are particularly difficult, like what, you know, what you're describing with the um, extension contractors or, or other difficult cases. Yeah. And, and actually, I'd like to say there, 
as much as they're difficult, they're also extremely rewarding because you get one of these kids up walking uh, where they've been told by a um, number of other practitioners that they never would. Uh, that is just uh, the biggest high you can get in orthopedics as far as I'm concerned. Um, research from the, you know, kind of the bench research side of things um, is scant. And that's because there are so many different things, uh, so many different conditions that cause arthrogryposis. So each individual one is an extremely rare condition and it's hard to get uh, a lot of attention in that direction. Um, most of the research that we see, uh, other than the clinical research, is genetics research, where you're just finding um, kiddos with arthrogryposis and trying to figure out what in the pathway caused them not to move interuterinely. Um, but I think that probably what's, what I'm most excited about is uh, being part of a bigger research project uh, that's creating a registry. So we have four of the, the Shriner sites uh, the Portland, Oregon site, the Northern California site, um, the Montreal Shriners Hospital and us. And we are grouping our patients together and trying to do phenotypic and genotypic studies to really try to understand these uh, kids as well as possible uh, and see if we can separate them into kind of different categories of involvement. And that may hopefully then drive us towards a uh, treatment. So I think at this point in time, it's more trying to treat the condition that you see versus trying to find any way to cure it. So obviously, you know, rare conditions like this, I guess it really helps to have some type of uh, network and uh, way that you can share information with, um, you know, colleagues trying to treat the same group of patients. And it sounds like that's how you're, uh, how you're trying to address this. Um, I hear correctly. And outside of Shriners, um, are there any other centers around the world that, um, that do a lot of this work? Um, is, there a, um, is there a subspecialty society uh, that focuses uh, on this specifically? I guess that's one of the exciting things about arthrogryposis that it's um, versus a lot of other parts of, uh, of orthopedics that are already well established and it's uh, hard to do anything new in them. Uh, this is still kind of an unexplored area that we're, a bunch of us are now kind of to get, get together on. On the East Coast, uh, DuPont Hospital uh, down in Wilmington uh, sees a lot of arthrogryposis. Uh, down in Florida, uh, my old partner Dave Feldman sees some kiddos. Um, and then you really have to go to like Texas Scottish Rite uh, or to the um, uh, Los Angeles Shriners Hospital, for example, to find other bigger areas, or in, in the Chicago Shriners Hospital. But there's not a lot of other specialty centers uh, in the U.S. Um, and in Europe, same kind of thing. There are there's a smattering of them around. But what's happened is that uh, those of us who treat these kids are starting to get together. We've now had three international conferences on arthrogryposis. The last one was about a year and a half ago here in Philadelphia. Uh, the next one will be next year in Montreal. And that's bringing us together, starting to uh, create some collaboration. Uh, like I said, we have this registry project going on. There's another registry project on adults with arthrogryposis. So I think you're going to see an explosion of knowledge that's happening over the next five or 10 years. Um, and that's hopefully going to change the landscape a lot for how we treat these kids. Uh, part of our issue is just getting the word out to our colleagues because people have been so used to treating kids with arthrogryposis a certain way, and that way has usually been uh, rather nihilistic. Uh, so it's nice to get the word out that you can really do a lot more with these kids. Um, and I, I think that, that just makes it more rewarding for everybody. And tell that um, you enjoy what you do and uh, having an opportunity to help these children. So I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, I've been speaking with uh, Dr. Harold Van Bossi from the Shriners Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. Uh, we've been talking about arthrogryposis, principles of management, and um, it was a great discussion. I really, uh, wanna really thank you for coming on the show. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you, Saka. Thanks.